So I want to I want to talk about my experience of um, trying to combine my dedicated job uh, around teaching with my sort of longer standing research interests um, around sustainable development and particularly place based and local sustainable development. Um, I knew that uh, that Carla would be confused by our my my institutional kind of setup because it is very confusing. Um, so I thought I would uh, I would just give you a bit of background. Um, so I'm part of the, the School for Cross-Faculty Studies within the University of Warwick. Um, strangely enough, we then fall under the Faculty of Arts. So this, I think, has an interesting sort of history of how it got created. Um, but we have two divisions uh, within our school, uh, Liberal Arts and uh, Global Sustainable Development. And it's the GSD side that I've, uh, I've been working on. We have started off uh, very much teaching, well, we did start off very much teaching focused. Um, so we have uh, started with a suite of nine joint degrees, um, which the student would take 50% of it uh, focused on global sustainable development uh, modules that we run, uh, and 50% with a partner department. Um, and these ranges you can see from sort of life sciences through to theater and performance studies. So the idea is to create a kind of inter and transdisciplinary approach to the sort of questions and themes of global sustainable development. Um, we take the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a very loose framework. Um, it's in kind of no way fundamentally tied to that, um, and we have kind of critical interactions and, and what have you. Um, we obviously consider the, the three spheres of sustainable development, but with a, another kind of major focus on, on governance, um, as runs through the, a lot of the UN programme. Um, we're now, this term, uh, sorry, next academic year, starting a new uh, undergrad degree, which will be a single honours uh, global sustainable development degree, which will all be uh, in-house. Um, so we're quite excited about that and expanding our, um, our provisions as well. So that's the, um, that's the context in which, which I'm working. Um, and I've been very interested in the idea of research teaching nexus, the way that universities combine research and teaching. Um, and am I right in thinking that everyone here is dedicated research-only contracts? Um, people tend, you, you're involved a bit of teaching as well, are you? No, I'm oh. actually, I work for a state. Oh, okay, oh, nice, nice. Oh, well, great, thank you for coming along. Um, there is some teaching that comes in. Okay. Ah, okay, nice. In that case, um, can I, I, I thought it would be a bit of audience participation if that's okay. Um, would you like to just have a chat with the person next to you? As academics, as people working within a university context, what, what are your thoughts on the way that we try to connect our research activities with our teaching activities? Um, either as an individual um, or as, a, as an institution. You can come at it from whichever angle you'd like. Um, but I'd be really interested to know what your thoughts are on how we're trying to do this before I talk a little bit about what I've been thinking about. Um, so I'll give you, I don't know, two minutes or something for a bit of a chat. Do you guys, um, do you feed in to the taught components of any of the degrees here with your research or are you entirely separated out? Okay. And do you, how do you feel about that? Are you pleased that you're able to sort of seclude yourselves away and, and focus on your research or would you like a bit more connection? Mm -hmm.
Okay. No. Yeah, but you get some opportunity to. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. And I mean, the, I tend to find students like that, don't they? They sort of the, the concrete. I have been here and I have seen this, and this is something from my experience, as opposed to like from the literature or whatever. Mm. Okay, nice, right? Well. Trying to get this, were they trying to get students to do some of the grunt work of the research ever? Like doing, because I think that happens quite a lot. You get, you get like a PhD student to do those interviews and then, you know, do a bit of analysis. Right, sorry to interrupt you. I better do some work. Um, this, uh, you didn't come along to, to be made to, made to discuss things, did you? Um, just, uh, just sort of very quickly, uh, is there anything that you guys talked about that you thought was you particularly interested in or? Things that you kind of. We were kind of wondering about the difference between our, because we were both at the University of Warwick before and, and here, and trying to understand the difference in the ways between research and teaching, research mm -hmm. institutions and approaches, and yeah. So in the way that it's quite crude, I think there's like your relationship between your research and your teaching is well, I've done some research, here it is. Um, maybe there's a, you kind of strengthen a little bit like what you know in, in telling someone else about it, but that's kind of it. And, or maybe as well you involve postgraduate or maybe undergraduate students in kind of doing some of the grunt work of your research, like going and doing mm -hmm. some experiments or whatever interviews, and then you kind of co-write the results or something. Yeah. Nice. So uh, the, the sort of for what I want to talk about that it's kind of the two ends of the, the spectrum of possibility that I, I think we, we we've got at. Um, you guys at the back were sort of reflecting that you don't have necessarily too much opportunity to to connect uh, research and teaching. You maybe don't do any teaching, but where you do, you can kind of introduce your your research into the materials that you um, you use with your students and. That can be kind of kind of stimulating. Um, so I'm uh, uh, a terrible uh, academic because I haven't put my my citations on. Um, but this is a, a framework that um, I'm fond of for for doing curriculum planning, um, and it, it it draws out four kind of stereotypical possibilities. Uh, and I think it's the sort of two um, spectrums to look at. Uh, but this first one being those activities that have an emphasis on the research content, so the substantive knowledge. Um, and those uh, activities and learning processes that have the emphasis on students being actively involved in the research, solving problems and what have you. Uh, and as Chris says, quite a lot of what we tend to do as university teachers is to teach about our research. Um, so either our personal research or research that's, that's drawn from the, the wider literature. Um, so this is often understood as uh, research-led teaching. Um, maybe we move from a, a lecture into a more kind of workshop or seminar-based uh, teaching and learning uh, activity where we get students to maybe start to engage with the literature in a more critical way. So we're not just delivering information, we're asking students to interrogate, to discuss, etc. Um, if we want to push more towards active student involvement, we've, we've got some options. Um, universities normally want to teach um, methodological uh, training to their students, so they want to be involved in knowledge creation themselves, so teaching the, the skills to do research. Um, and the, f the final bit um, that, that really interests me is this idea of uh, research-based teaching. So, um, as Chris came to by the end, where we're getting our students actively involved in participating in research, real research that we're actually actually doing. Um, so this is the, the sort of the box that I wanted to start to, to push towards 
um, within our course. We obviously dealing with a very real world subject, um, and we try to lead with kind of problem based uh, learning and, and real life authentic learning activities. So that's what I wanted to go for. Um, I've always worked on kind of place based uh, themes. Um, I came when I came from Cardiff. I came from the school of, of geography and planning. Um, so I've been interested in in this. And our, our degree is global sustainable development. We're always looking at international case studies, uh, global processes, because that's where like, the impact is, isn't it? That's the sexy bit. Um, but I think this overlooks a huge responsibility to the knowledge about our local area and local sustainable development. Um, reflecting on the history of the University of Warwick, from my understanding, Warwick's traditionally been interested in you know, international impact, the global, um, and hasn't engaged with Coventry and the regional area. Um, now, this is changing. We've got a bit of a steer now from our senior management, which I'm tapping into, and I wanted to kind of concretise that. So I wanted to look at local sustainable development uh, in the city of Coventry. Um, and again, my titles are always far too wordy. So uh, keeping the, the phoenix flying or clipping its wings, uh, I want to look at the student research and the praxis, so the bringing together of theory and practice in local sustainable development. That was, where, that was my kind of overview. Um, these are my intended learning outcomes. So if I'm looking at local, I'm interested in the kind of the concept of scale and how that ties into to the sustainable development planning processes, um, particularly focusing on the local and a, and a kind of a problematized understanding of that, what, you know, what is local sustainable development, where and how do you draw the, draw the boundaries. Um, Drawing again on my sort of geographical, uh, my previous geographical um, experience and exposure, thinking about the role of not just spatial interactions in sustainable development, but also the kind of the human lived experience of place um, and how people attach meaning to specific places as opposed to thinking about everything as sort of spatial, um, uh, spatial aggregations. Um, and I wanted to make it practical, focused on policy, um, combining kind of conceptual and theoretical ideas in, in a in a sort of real-world planning idea, um, environment. Um, I also was hoping that students might start to think about how universities should be interacting with, um, with the real world and the kind of the local context um, as maybe a more of a sort of implicit aim. So that's what I was, I was working towards. Um, who knows much about the city of Coventry? A little bit? A little bit? A little bit. Um, so to, to the, my, this was sort of, I guess, my intellectual journey as someone. So I, um, I used to work overseas after I worked in, uh, in the University of uh, Cardiff. I went to live on a tropical island in Panama. Um, I did place-based learning with US undergraduates. Um, and I never thought I would come and live in Coventry. And one day I did. Um, and I realized that it was a fascinating place. And I think I'm the first, I think I'm the first person in history ever to move from a tropical island to live in Coventry. <laughs> I don't know if anyone, if anyone knows any other examples, um, I'd, I'd be interested. Um, which, which may sound uh, a ridiculous move, but I instantly became fascinated by the city. And it was sort of this kind of the post-war history of reconstruction that I, I found really interesting. Um, so as, we, as I'm sure we all know, uh, Coventry suffered a lot of uh, bomb damage during the war, um, <coughs> which it slowly re rebuilt from, um, built upon its, uh, its sort of history of uh, industrial production. Um, to become a big centre of motor manufacturing. Um, the influence of the car can be seen in, in the post-war reconstruction and planning, the, the aspiration to produce a sort of an urban centre that provided space for, for people and pedestrians, but also um, managed the, the car usage in, a, in an effective and an efficient way, um, in a safe way, keeping them separate. So this was the, uh, the car park on top of the, the market, I think. Um, when it was first first built. It's not much different. So. <laughs> Where's IKEA? <That's>, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, as as we know, the sort of the, the heart, the industrial heart of the city, all started to, to fall apart. So here we've got uh, rates of unemployment, uh, 1950s through to 1982, um, and in the 70s we see see massive changes, um, loss of uh, loss of loss of jobs for the local population. Um, the specials, of course, um, not I believe not directly drawing on this, um, but the, the local group um, embodied this in, in song uh, to pick out some of the lyrics uh, critical of the government leaving the youth on the shelf, 
uh, no jobs to be found in this country, and the people are, are getting angry. So this obviously speaks to a lot of the themes of global sustainable development, the environmental, the economic, um, and, and the social, I think. So I, I got kind of interested. Um, and then the, the, the subsequent story of, um, of economic improvement, of, of privatised-led redevelopment, um, and everything that, that went on around that. So this was my, my intellectual background and something that I wanted the students to be, be interested in um, and to, to get them to think not about just the problems of, of global poverty um, and global environmental destruction and disaster, but what's going on in our local environment. The fact that within the city, within a, you know, a certain stone's throw of, of the university where we're very privileged, there are people living in conditions of serious deprivation. Um, the urban ecology, um, as will be the case with any city, how that's been affected by... Um, by the development trajectory, um, how this kind of gets overlaid by social tensions and, and what have you, um, and so to, you know, to, to engage with, with these issues. So real world problems, um, I think a really useful starting point from a teaching perspective is to think about your assessment first, um, and to think about if you can create an assessment that is authentically engaging with the world, not just as an exercise of our market and put it in the bin, but can we be using this to create useful knowledge um, for our own research agendas and, and kind of wider interests? So this is what I, I wanted to do, and I came up with um, a sort of a three-part assessment um, uh, diet. So my first bit was to, to get students to work in, in groups to compile uh, reports on the sustainable development trajectory of, um, of the city. I wanted them to have the opportunity to focus on themes that interested them, because I think that's always a good way to get people motivated, or at least to, to help get people motivated if you give them some, some scope. Um, so the first bit was thinking about where's Coventry come from, where are we at now? The second bit was to think we're always we're a sort of a problem-based um, teaching institution, but we're, we try to remain positive because obviously you can get quite depressing. So we're constantly trying to inject opportunities for students to use evidence-based um, knowledge creation to propose solutions. Um, so the idea, could, could we ask students to provide either a policy change or maybe even a concrete project that was specifically or specifically responded to their identification of the problems? Um, so this is very kind of student-defined. Um, and finally, some kind of reflective account of the process or something that I could use to capture their wider understanding of place-based uh, development. So that was sort of a more kind of traditional assessment, maybe. Um, to support students to be able to, to, to contribute to that, um, <coughs> well, actually, yeah, first I should say that the other thing about this, because we've got um, multidisciplinary uh, sort of student degrees and what have you, Again, I hope this could allow them to bring in their disciplinary interests. So if they were theatre and performance, they could focus on that. If they were history or politics, they could, they could take that interest. Um, but to get them there teaching-wise, I conceived of having kind of two workshops or workshop times. Um, the first where we could provide some kind of substantive knowledge input. Um, and the second, oh, actually, it's still around. So I've changed this a little bit. So this is my original plan, this is what I presented to the students, that we'd have um, two-hour planning workshops with a focus on them and kind of actively working with knowledge, um, and then one-hour expert input sessions. Um, so I wanted this to be uh, real life, so drawing on real-world experts, not, not me delivering my knowledge, um, which obviously by this stage is fairly minimal because I'm, I'm new to the city and I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, and I wanted to... to, to get students to work as a, as a research group, really, as opposed to a class of students learning, or at least to try to experiment with, with that idea. In terms of my programme, my ambition was to define, so the, we work in 10-week terms, um, I wanted to define uh, the first couple of weeks themes that I thought were particularly important from my understanding, but then try to create uh, sessions that were framed around the student interest and the themes that they um, they found fascinating about the city. Uh, so that was, that was my plan. Um, and I think, again, this is what I presented to, to the students as, as what I was hoping to do. So some introductory work. I was thinking about local councillors for governance, um, getting a physical understanding of the city, 
to embed them in, the, in that real world um, physical environment. Moving into space and place and history, uh, coming through to some of the sort of the social aspects of, of community concerns, trying to draw on networks of um, actors within the city who, you know, who live and, and work here, um, thinking about planning and, and, and what have you, and then leaving things open to, to see where student interest um, developed into. So that was, yeah, that was my plan. Um, I also wanted, again, to create assessment that wasn't just like marked and then put in the bin. Um, in my other modules, I've given students the opportunities to sort of to revise and to, to informally publish their work. Um, so I do environmental policy, um, environmental principles. All the first class work, the students are given the opportunity to respond to the final set of comments, um, and then you can go on our website and you can see them. Um, so again, hopefully this is motivating for students. And I think in a lot of cases, they're, they're drawing together, they're doing literature reviews that are, that are very valid and, and useful for, for lots of people. Um, so I wanted to, my ambition was to do a similar thing. Um, and if I was getting community input, uh, I wanted to make sure that we were reciprocating and providing something back, hopefully that, that was seen to be, be valuable, or, you know, although that was always going to be an open question. So this was always part of the, part of the planning. <coughs> the realities of doing this, um, it gave me a great summer holiday because I spent my entire summer having cups of coffee and lunches with stakeholders in Coventry. Um, and this was just, this was my planning for the course. I was making connections um, and setting things up, which I think is, was very necessary groundwork. What that meant was that when we came to the term, it was, it was kind of often very dynamic. So what I think the, the most ironic uh, situation was with the economic planners in the city um, who planned to come in, I think, on three occasions. But because things came up at the last minute, entirely understandably, they had to you know, pull out the day before or what have you, and I had to, to rearrange. Um, so that made it quite a stressful experience. But thinking about the research teaching nexus, it reminded me of been out doing field work when you're setting up interviews, meeting busy people, um, constantly sort of rearranging it. So it was, it was, a, it was a reminder of that, and I, I kind of felt that that was, that was actually okay, even though it was, it was stressful. Um, I realised that parking arrangements at the University of Warwick are a categoric barrier to entry. Um, I either had to invite them so far in advance to get all the paperwork out to them and get them paid for that it was impossible, um, or I had to ask them to turn up giving their time for free, and then pay for their parking, and then fill in paperwork to recuperate the money, which I think is unwelcoming. Um, or I had to run around campus with £2.50 to put in the machine, which is what I did. Um, so it sounds, it, sort of, it sounds silly, but in terms of engaging with people and trying to get stakeholders in, opening up the university, like this really doesn't help. Um, so that was, that was learning. Um, overall, I managed to... We, we held a program together, which I think was, um, was very effective and has produced some, some really, really nice uh, student work. This was the eventual program that we ended up with, so I just put this together um, recently, having a, a think back. Um, so started off with some introductions, my kind of take on the, the sustainable development trajectory, um, along with the nuts and bolts of how the course was, um, the module was going to work. Um, then in the, the first two-hour workshop, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a, a fairly popular history book by Peter Walters about the city of Coventry. Um, lots, of, lots of pictures. He draws on a lot of journalistic sources. It's not a rigorous academic text. Um, but I started off using that just as a way to try to kind of excite and interest students in the city and its history. Um, and that really seemed to work. All the students came out of that session saying, oh, my God, like I didn't realise that Coventry was that that interesting. Um, so that worked nicely, getting them to read individual chapters, uh, contribute to sort of like a reading group style, so starting to experience the type of work that we might be doing as, as researchers. Um, in the second week, uh, a lot of our sessions tried to sort of mix between uh, quick presentations, group Q&A, but, but I framed it as the idea of a group interview. So I asked students to prepare to think about the sort of the background themes before meeting um, a, an expert who would provide a short presentation about the things they thought were important. And then it, it sort of it moved into a dynamic engagement. So interview style, style thing. Um, Which chancellor was it? Ah, yeah, uh, great question. Uh, Bally Singh from Wobbly. 
Um, and he was, he was very excited um, about this opportunity. And in fact, everyone I spoke to, especially the, the, the sort of the local contacts, went, oh, really interesting. You know, like the University of Warwick has, has never come anywhere near us before. <laughs> um, how, how nice. And they, they came in with kind of excitement and interest and engagement um, and, and, yeah, really made it, it what it, I think, what it turned out to be. So that was, that was really nice. Um, so the, the, the red is where I had a fully external contributor. The yellow is where I had a sort of internal university contributor. So on reflection, I achieved some of what I wanted, but ideally, next, I think next time I'd like to see a bit more, a bit more red here um, to, to sort of develop and deepen that, that idea of an authentic research process. But I'm going to sort of say I feel this was, this was a necessary starting point. Um, and hopefully I can, I can go a bit further. Um, what else do we do that might be interesting? So I thought about the availability of online data. Um, so we had a kind of computer-based workshop on that, which combined a bit of uh, sort of training around how to use online statistics um, with exploring some possible sources that students could use. Um, we had a lot of kind of planning meetings where the groups could work together think about how they were going to take their project forward, what they were, um, what they were going to uh, include, mm, and some more kind of traditional seminar-style uh, interactions where we all kind of read papers and came back and reflected on, is sustainable development a, like a neoliberal co-option, and should we be rejecting it in terms of local uh, development aspirations, or is it a useful framework? What do we want to do? Um, so hopefully that's the, where the practice bit came in. Um. <coughs> I suppose, so that of the people that do do teaching, do people use Moodle? You do, Chris. Ah, the states do. You do a bit as well. Um, so I don't know if, uh, how much you guys have experimented with the possibilities of Moodle. Um, as little as possible. As little as possible. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's not, often, not often the best. What, uh, do, do you... Are you a experimenting and trying to find the workaround on the YouTube. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, no, that, yeah, that does sound like a familiar process uh, for a certain. Um, I, I'm quite interested in technology. I think I have a tendency sometimes to maybe use technology for the sake of it, which is a, a, not a good thing. Um, but hopefully, usually I get a kind of a good mix between um, rigorous pedagogy and, um, uh, and the technology. So some of the things that I built in, has anyone ever used the glossary function for Moodle? Um, so this, this can be quite nice. So you can set up a, a block that, that builds a glossary, um, and you can invite the Moodle users to contribute um, terms. So if you have a, you know, you get your student cohort to build up a, an encyclopedia of, of key terms or whatever with definitions, and you can embed that with kind of instructions and training around how to make sure it's rigorous, um, and again, sort of citations, so we can make sure we, we follow things back. Um, and then there's another nice function in it, which doesn't always work brilliantly, but where that term then appears in any of your Moodle content, it provides a hyperlink instantly to the term. So it's, it can be a good way of building kind of student academic uh, vocabulary and sort of conceptual mapping and things. So I, had a, I offer students the opportunity to use that. Um, I built in, has anyone ever used the, the sort of the journaling options? Uh, students can write sort of wikis and things. So I thought, although I didn't want to force them to write things as we went on, maybe if there was a, a space where they were invited to do that, they could keep notes, I could see, interact, I could sort of provide commentary and, and whatever. So I, I built in that optional, I called it a reflective journal, but I think I might, I might change that. Um, has anyone ever invited their students to contribute to the reading list where they can just add things. So I had a go with this. I thought if we're working as a research team, we'd probably always be sharing kind of research papers and what have you. Let's see if we can get the students on board with that. So I built up quite extensive um, bibliographies and, and reading lists, but I created it as a wiki so students could always add things to see if uh, we, could, we could help build knowledge that way. Um, and I also used uh, Moodle for sharing the outcomes of our, of our discussions. So um, a lot of my seminar work, I'll, I'll do a, uh, like a brainstorm diagram 
um, on, the, on the whiteboard, take a picture, post it up on Moodle um, as, a, as a sort of a, a revision aid or whatever. So as, in terms of our, our kind of group planning, again, working as a research team, I tried having a go at that. Um, so again, these are my aspirations. Um, who would like to see how those worked out? Um, I meant to put a link in here. Am I on the right one? Uh, this might be more complicated. So, this is my Moodle. Um, so I've also got some features in here. So I created a, a news forum, so I would post up clippings from local newspapers and um, other research that I found that I thought might be interesting. Um, discussion forum, I offered the students as well if they wanted to, again, use that as a planning tool. Let's see how many discussions we got. Ah, so we got... Two discussion, yeah, two themes in ten weeks from two students. So they weren't particularly enticed by that. Um, the glossary. Any offers on how many terms students decided to contribute to my glossary? Four, quite a lot. Twenty. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, great question. So there were eight students, so we started with quite a small group. Um, so there's a few in here. Um, those are all mine. <laughs> I, I put those in to start with. So I didn't manage to persuade the students to, to do that, um, which, I don't know. Reflective journal. So of eight students, how many do we think use the reflective journal option? Given the trends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice evidence-based. Uh, yeah, no, so none of them did that. Um, yeah, and anonymous feedback, thank you. <laughs> no, didn't, I don't think I got any anonymous feedback. So that was, um, that was a, quite a nice thing. Uh, it being a small group and working quite closely, we, I think we, we discussed verbally quite a lot of the things that are maybe a bigger cohort might have put in the, in the anonymous feedback. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the overall reflection here is that my planning hasn't really worked out. So this isn't enticing students for one reason or another, um, which I was a bit disappointed with, um, but it's something that I, I want to go away and have a, you know, have a think about. Um, is it because it's just not useful or is it about how I'm presenting it? Do you have any thoughts on it? About what's... Why, why is Moodle so unpopular with students? Yeah. So, it, actually, really interestingly, I asked up front about creating a, um, a, a Facebook page as well, because I know our students use that a lot for the society and for the cohorts. They share a lot of information. They share academic journals, um, all sorts of things. Um, and no one was that interested in doing it. Or then halfway through the term, I realized that they were doing it. They just hadn't told me about it. Um, <laughs> so I, I wonder if part of it, so part of it could be the platform and the, the problematic nature of Moodle sometimes. Um, but then also, I think a bit of it is that the idea of having a space that's theirs. Um, so although I, as a teacher, I'm wanting to reach in and provide as much feedback as I can, because apparently that's what we're supposed to be doing and I think is good, students seem to not necessarily always want, want that. It's um, like posting on your parents' Facebook page yes. every day. It's just, just it's so rude. I mean, I think there's a barrier of that it's a new platform that you have to like sign into and you might don't necessarily get good notifications. Or so. Yeah, I think it's a bit kind of contrived. Yes. Yeah, and 
it's a it's a total new space that's dedicated for this learning thing, right? Where Facebook is a bit more yeah. part of your life. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I mean, I think these are really interesting questions that will be uh, well worth exploring to see if we can reach more of a um, a compromise um, on how we how we use these things. You didn't make it. You didn't make it obligatory to engage. No. Um, that might be a thing that, although it sounds bad. Mm. Yes. And then at least you're in there and you're going, all right, maybe I will post something else. Yeah, and at least you have an opportunity to see maybe there is some value in being here and looking at what my peers have said, um, et cetera. Uh, so, yeah, so with, the, with my other module, the environmental principles, I, the glossary activity was a, was a required task for uh, like week three and then later on. Um, and students did contribute to that um, a lot. Well, they had to. Um, because it was the conditionality was set, they couldn't see the other activities unless they'd done those things. Um, no one said in the feedback that they they learnt a lot, a particular amount from that. Um, but next year, I think I'm going to make the journaling a, a formative requirement. So every week they have to write something, um, because one of the major reflections at the end was that <laughs> they were upset that I hadn't made them start working sooner, um, and I had from the very first week said, you should start you know, writing now. Just write some notes. Like for every, you know, every 10 works, words you write in week one, maybe you can use those in, for your assessment. Um, and no one did, and they were all super stressed in the last week. Um, and then in the informal feedback, they said, well, yeah, you should have, should have made us do this, which I think is, is valid. I mean, I've got some problems <coughs> with, the, with, the, with some of the underlying assumptions there. Um, but so next time, I'm thinking of making this journal a requirement. Um, at least then I can sort of get in a bit and then see how things how things go. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes there's there's value with a stick as well as the carrot, right? Um, who, who were the students? Was that? Um, ah, yeah, good question. Uh, so I got quite a diversity um, of uh, nationalities um, and also disciplinary mixes. So uh, politics, business, um, economic. No one from theatre and performance. No life science students, unfortunately. But bit, bit of a, a bit of a range. Um, and then I had students from Italy and France, uh, Wales, and England. So, ah, uh, yes. So one of them had lived, um, has lived in the city for for a while. Um, and I think they, yeah, it, they seem to invest quite, you know, a significant amount. Um, we don't have a lot of, uh, uh, sort of local students, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, the, the one student did, did come along. Um, so, um, oh yeah, overall reflections. So I thought I'd see what I'd ended up saying anyway. Um, so I'm going to run it again. Uh, and I'm allowed to run it again, so that's, uh, I think that's a good baseline. Um, the, the major reflection being that I want, I want to make sure that I'm pushing students to, to engage more in the kind of the writing, because I think that, that created a big stress for them um, at the end, um, which, was, which was problematic. They did... Hmm. Some of the work they did was, I think, exceptional. I was so, so pleased. Um, we had a, an engagement session with the Coventry Society just last week, and two of them spoke... Um, on the themes of aesthetics and architecture and sustainable development um, and food and feeding and uh, sustainable development in, in Coventry. Um, and the members of the Coventry Society who are mm, uh, broadly older, sort of retired, retired men but have exceptional personal knowledge of the city and experience, um, the two student presentations stimulated amazing conversation and discussion between them. Um, a lot of their comments were kind of broad agreement with additional suggestions, um, some kind of critical interrogation, but they started discussing between them about, again, like the, you know, the nature of Coventry's architecture and to what degree it's um, sort of objectively holding back um, economic change or, or what have you. So on the, and I, the, the, quality, the academic quality of the work was great, and I, I think the sort of the, the, the content of it in terms of that ability to stimulate people who are involved was, um, w was really good as well. Um, so in terms of the research output, 
I'm, I'm really, really pleased. Um, and I'm hoping we can kind of add to what we've got and to diversify over, over time. Um, and the overall ambition is that we can pull something together over a, a series of years that we can actually put together as a, as a much more professional output um, and share with, the, with whatever audiences are interested. Um, the organization was, was complicated. It was, it, I think, much more stressful than a traditional way of teaching. But as I say, it mirrored quite nicely um, my experience of doing that field research um, and gave students exposure to that as well, which I think is, is valuable. Um, even though it's stressful for them, the reality is that, well, at least in my experience, that is how it is. Um, so, so that was a, an interesting and unexpected outcome, I think. Um, yeah, and then the technological side, I think I obviously need to rethink some of the tools that I'm proposing um, and different ways to get, to get students involved. Um, and overall, I'm the, one of the reasons that I'm so pleased for the opportunity to come to chat to you guys is if there can be kind of connections between uh, the research work of people who may be thinking about Coventry um, or any of the kind of the teaching agendas here at the university, although I appreciate you guys are not necessarily directly involved, um, that would be, I think that would be, be great. So not only building our university's relationship with the city, but also trying to connect a little bit with you know, with, with the university here. Um, so that's my, yeah, my overall conclusion. I want to keep going, and I want to sort of involve um, more people if, if there are people who are interested. Um, so thank you very much, and I'd be very happy to answer any other questions that, that you guys might have. <coughs>